step in my dojo, you step, 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 step. Step in my dojo, you step in my dojo. Hey, 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 yo, 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 what up? Hey, 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 hello, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. At Producer Dojo, we have a constant stream of live events waiting for you to come get your learn on. Sign up at the link below to make sure you don't miss out. So our first track is from Ilya O, who is uh, an excellent video artist, a member of Producer Social, and he has this track Cyber Trap here, which I'm going to play. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's listen and check it out, and I will provide some track feedback. Very cool, very cool. So uh, I think that the info that I have to share with you, uh, I, I think I, I've, I can, uh, you know, I think I can tell already uh, what sorts of things that I can offer to help you with your, this particular track and to help you with where you're at as a producer right now. So Ilya Oh, by participating in this uh Producer Dojo Summit by participating and being selected for track feedback. I want to let you know that you have won three months of access to the complete weekly download archive. So uh, you will be hearing back from us in email and you have access now to the weekly download archive. So I'm going to recommend some weekly downloads for you and recommend some concepts. So once you get into the weekly download, you will go to members.producerdojo.com and log in. And if you go here, this is where you go to the weekly download live class. You can see there's also there's all these other modules and everything and templates and workflows and blah, blah, blah. But in the weekly download, if you go to the weekly download and you go to all episodes in chronological order, you can see here that as, as of the time of this filming, there are 181 of these weekly downloads. And if you just press Command F, uh, and then you can search through the weekly downloads. So um, there's a few different weekly downloads that I want to draw your attention to and a few different concepts that I want to draw your attention to. But uh, Ilya, if you're out there, please take some notes because these uh, recommendations are specific specific to you. All right, so the first thing I want to draw your attention to is when you're listening to this track, this track, like, there's, there's like a kind of, a, you know, there's a difference between making beats and making songs, you know? And when, uh, you know, when you think about making beats, think about like a, a producer like Jay Dilla, you know, and listening to like a Jay Dilla mixtape. What Jay Dilla would do, his process would work like this. He would sit down with his MPC and he would make a whole bunch of these kind of short uh, beats that were, you know, he'd have a sample that he'd be flipping and some drums and some bass and basically just be making it sound dope. And, you know, the parts a lot of the time would be kind of like simple and repetitive, but he was focusing on getting 
getting the, the, the groove in the pocket, making sure that it's pl pleasant to listen to, and getting it just ready for a mixtape. But there was always that space in these beats that a rapper could fill, that a vocalist could fill. You know, the, the parts were written in a kind of looping, repetitive way, and there wasn't that like big, aggressive, loud, in front sound that, that would typically be occupied by like a vocal performance or like a guitar solo or something else that's meant to sit in front of the music. And what you've created here is, is a beat. You know, and, and uh, this beat is like, you know, you're not really doing anything wrong. There's a few mixing things that, that I want to point out. But the way that the parts are created and the way that it is sequenced, there is still that space for the vocal to sit in front. And what, uh, what Jay Dilla or these other kind of like mixtape producer beat makers would do is they'd make a whole bunch of these beats where there was that space for vocalist. They would put them together into a mixtape and you know there would be some like shout outs that they'd get from their rapper friends or maybe like some samples from movies on top that they would have here and there to occupy the, the in front space. But then they would show that beat tape to different rappers and rappers would be like, oh hey, you know, that beat at 15 minutes with the horn sample, I want to license that one from you uh, and, and you know, buy it for my album or whatever. And the, the mixtape would kind of be like a showcase of these different producer beats that rappers would buy and then they would be the sound that sits in front. So the thing to understand is, you know, when it comes to listening to music, most people hear two things. They hear the singer, which sits in front and occupies the spotlight and is the main focus of the composition. And then there's the sounds that are in the band, which work as a group and sit in the back and try not to draw attention to themselves, right? And I find a lot of producers, they will, you know, if they understand this, this singer and band dichotomy, a lot of the time they'll kind of like turn their noses up at those who need a singer to sit in front of the composition and they'll they'll turn their noses up at that that as though the people who who only listen to vocal music are somehow uneducated or un capable of appreciating real music, instrumental music, producer music, right? And I think that that's a, a, a limiting belief that a lot of producers have. They, they kind of say like, oh, well, I don't make pop music, you know, I make producer music, and the music that I make is, you know, it's beyond that simplistic level of listening. But the reason why people separate the music into the singer, which sits in front, and the band, which sits in the back and kind of occupies that, that, that collective groove space, uh, is because of the dynamics of human perception, right? Because of the dynamics of human perception. Our brain is designed through evolution to separate our environment into the figure or the foreground and the background. And that's because there are certain things in nature that are more relevant to our decision making and other things that we're still noticing in perception, but are not necessarily important to making a decision at any given time. So let's say you're a, a woodland creature and you come into a clearing right the first things that that will that you'll notice that will occupy that central spot in your attention are maybe the sounds of the reverb space opening up as you leave the trees and maybe it's the sound of the cicadas uh, or the wind rustling in the grass and those things will all at first occupy that central slot in your attention but then as you become more used to those sounds they will kind of group together and form the background of the clearing and then you know maybe there's a, a, a twig snaps and instantly that twig that has snapped snap to the foreground of your attention while the sounds of the clearing and the insects and the grass are in the background now because that twig snap might mean a predator is approaching or it might mean there's something else that you should pay attention to. Maybe there's an animal you can eat. Maybe there's an animal that's trying to eat you. And then after a while, there's no more twig snapping. You're listening, you're listening.
maybe there's an animal that's trying to eat you. And then after a while, there's no more twigs snapping. You're listening, you're listening. The other sounds come to the foreground. And then the, there's a rustling as that animal moves again. And then the rustling sound is occupying the foreground, right? So what makes a sound occupy the foreground slot is this, I, this novelty, you know, that there's something new about that sound, that there is some form of emergent complexity. There is some form of communication happening. That's what makes a sound occupy the central figure slot in your attention. And there's this, uh, what they call the magic number seven plus or minus three of these attention slots or groups that your brain can hold in your attention at once. And that's why phone numbers are seven digits plus the area code, for example. Anytime you have more than seven things going on, you simply cannot pay attention to those seven things. So when you're composing, how, how this novelty and this figure and the ground apply to composing, right, is you've got to think of you know, think of whether you're making instrumental music or you're making uh, vocal music, you've got to think of it as communication, right? You've got to think about emotional communication, right? There are some sounds that are going to set the stage. There are some sounds that are going to, um, that are going to create a, a space, you know, a stage, an emotion, a vibe in which these other sounds can come in. And then there are some sounds that are going to have as much novelty as possible, as much emotional communication as possible, and as much content as possible that are going to occupy the front slot of your attention. So because the parts that you've written here, a lot of them are very looping and they do not change, right? Well, at the beginning of each section, these parts will occupy the figure slot. As these parts loop more and more, then you will get more and more used to them and your brain kind of puts them on the back burner and it kind of puts them on the back shelf and the track through virtue of the repetitiveness of the sequencing becomes background. Right. So when you want a sound to occupy that central figure slot in the composition, you not only need to mix it as though it sits in front of the rest of the sounds and is as three dimensional as possible and is as um, as focal as possible, stealing the spotlight. But you also need to have as much articulation in that central sound as possible, right? So some weekly downloads that I can recommend that will help you to understand this are, there is a weekly download on phrasing, right? That is number 118, okay? That weekly download on phrasing, I get very much into, you know, what are the laws of rhyme and of grammar and of change? How do those laws of change apply to composition and how can we make our parts rhyme and flow in a way that gives them a lyrical quality. And I think if you were to go in and resequence some of your leads, that the lyrical quality that you can apply to those leads using these phrasing techniques will help those particular sounds occupy that, that central vocal style slot in your, uh, in your attention. So I want you to check out phrasing. And then I also want you to go check out some of this uh, phase three series, okay? So uh, when you are, oh man, I can't type today, P H. A S E. Yeah, so I did uh, several parts on phase three here. Um, now, as I see it, there are five phases of songwriting, right? The final phases are mastering. Phase five is mastering. Phase four is mixing, like doing your final mix. But the first three phases are composition. And those phases are generating your ideas and creating what I call the super loop, which is a large kind of looping section where everything is looping all at once. And you're saying yes or no to different ideas, try, you, you know, trying to, muting and unmuting parts as you add them to the loop until you find one part that is the central character of your narrative, one part that is going that is, is the face of your song. It's the, the part that, that makes the song unique, that, that makes the song uh, describable, that makes the song really hit home with your listener. Then once you've got that super loop with a whole bunch of ideas and you've got one best idea, which is the face, you would then in phase two arrange your song and copy the super loop out until it fills like two minutes or whatever of arrangement. And then saying like, okay, this because of this face, I'm going to, you know, have a, a intro that's maybe 
eight bars, or maybe your intro is 32 bars, creating a, a tension and a release. Uh, and then you, you deliver the face, and then you articulate the face to tell the narrative and create the arrangement. Usually in phase two, you will max out your processor, and a lot of people, they will kind of get to this point where it's hard to maneuver. You know, you'll make an edit in the song, and then there will be, you know, it, it, you make an edit, and you'll have to be like, oh, is, is that edit going to going to populate and you'll be like waiting for your 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 computer to respond and because your processor is so maxed and it's so hard to work a lot of the time people will abandon a track and call it done simply because their processor has been pushed to the extreme right and i want to tell you one of the biggest secrets that the pros know is phase 3 and in phase 3 of the compositional process after getting you know deciding on a rough arrangement deciding what sound is the face you know trying to get a rough version of your your transitions and everything you'll save a new version of your track and then flatten all of those stems flatten all of those midi parts and turn them into audio parts and in processing them and turning them into audio, you're going to be getting rid of all those plugins that are pushing your processor to the limit and making it so that you can't work. And you'll have something that gives you the same audio result as phase two, but by virtue of the fact that it is stems, that it is printed audio stems and not MIDI parts, these this new project of stems is going to be coming in at like maybe 10 or 15% of your processor. And then you can go in and add all of this articulation and phrasing and sort out your transitions and do additional sound design and maybe replace some of your boring placeholder parts with new additionally sound design parts that have more rhythm and more rhyme and more flow and more sound design because you'll have your whole processor back in phase three. So I want you to introduce phase three to your songwriting process and I want you to check out these three videos on phase three which are going to be about adding more articulation to your sounds and uh, you know adding additional sound design to the sound and really getting that central like that sound that you've decided to be the face to, to rhyme and flow and articulate and sit up in the front of the mix, okay? Um, then you should definitely also check out Weekly Download 131, which is mixing tips with Seth Drake. Seth Drake is an incredible uh, mixing and mastering engineer. He has his own spinoff from the dojo um, that we've, uh, that we've uh, worked with with him, the approach by SethDrake.com, where he has his whole mixing course. Uh, but you can get a taste of what Seth Drake is about, get a taste of some of his mixing knowledge in this weekly download 131 where he spends two hours doing a mix down uh, for everybody in the weekly download. It's an incredible weekly download and it will really help you to get your, your final mix uh, together. Um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot more that I would have for you about mixing and stuff, but I think the main things to focus on are you know, getting the singer sound to sit in front by articulating it, by phrasing it, by taking your mix to phase three and really, you know, bringing that polish and then uh, giving it an excellent mix down after that. Okay, so thank you so much, Ilya, for your participation. I really, really appreciate you. Uh, and I enjoy your three months of access to the weekly download. Okay, so which of these other ones are we going to go into here? Um, let's try this one. All right, here we go. So uh, this submission is from Quinn Johnstadt, a.k.a. QJ. And, uh, you know, congratulations. You are now uh, going to have three months of access to the weekly download. Let's check out your submission, which is E mastered house uh, to a home. I turn house to home. Hey, it's QJ. Baby. Oh, give me a minute alone. Oh, I turn that house to a home. Oh, and that's all day with the homies. Oh. But I did it on my own. Uh, I turn a house to a home. Uh, I turn a dub to a O. Uh, and I turn up with the gang, gang. You know we back to the bone. Uh, hopping a whip in an Audi. Uh, driving my vision is cloudy. Uh, still we be shining like diamonds. Uh, don't need a watch cause I'm timeless. Oh, uh, sparkly necklace. Ooh. Bought it, we 
be reckless, ooh Checking the checklist, ooh And I'm so faded, I'm smoking the Nexus, ooh I don't compare with nobody, even if you want me to Baby gon' hop in my Gaudi, cause you know she want me to And I be strong in my body, just like in Dominic and Sue Pussies be ready to study, I just be up in a stool I cannot stop with the moves If she on my body, then she gonna get it And this shit is out of the blue But you looking hotty and I wanna dig it And no, I ain't done in the stool But baby, come over and we can make love to the music We can make love to the music We cannot hop in a jet, but we can make love to the music I don't got bands in the back, but we can make love to the music I'm really just trying to hold you, really just trying to hold you Really just trying to hold you, trying to make love to the music I'm trying to make love to the music Oh, give me a minute alone, oh Man, what a great submission. Those vocals sound excellent. The beat has uh, a lot of character and personality. There's a lot of uh, beautiful negative space in the beat. It hasn't been crowded and, and packed too full of sounds. And really, everything that's in there, it feels really right. It feels really right. And you're doing a great job of having that vocal sit up in front and center in the mix. So um, some things that I want to draw your attention to here that I think can improve uh, can improve this song. First of all, I don't know if this song needs to be four minutes long. Like it's pretty long, right? Um, and I also am really, you know, I feel like the a lot of the, the parts like the the, the kind of main keyboard part is really static, you know, it's like, you know, like everything about the loop feels nice, you know, like the, 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 um, the, the drum sounds you've chosen, the pattern you've chosen, the mix, everything. I feel so great. It's the best decision I made to really take my music skills to the next level. I just feel so much confidence now in the process and just kind of, you know, writing without having inspiration, like when else in my life I, I, I thought that would be possible. And now I can sit down and have like three, four ideas, uh, four drops, because I learned drops paid the bills. Yes. <laughs> and I can have like four awesome drops done in a day. And that's just mind blowing. The drum sounds you've chosen, the pattern you've chosen, the mix, everything about it feels nice. But really the beat and everything is kind of like, it's really staying the same and because there are not these like roller coaster up and downs in the ride uh, and these these little variations and dropouts and stuff that the, the the staticness of the beat like it helps to make the vocal sit in front and it helps to make the vocal the center of attention in the song but it starts to make the arrangement drag Okay, it starts to make the arrangement drag. And I feel like if you're going to have the song um, that is that long, you know, I think that a few little articulations that you can add to it uh, will really, really help. So one thing that I think is a great way to add articulation is to put automations on your groups. If you have like even just like a low pass and a beat repeat on the full on the full like drum bus mix if you have a low pass that like slowly opens up on all of the drums at once and you have like two bars where the drum beat well maybe you'll put a beat repeat type of style effect on it or just have the kick go like while low pass opens up for two bars that will make it sound like that section that little mini section is just completely different than what was happening before. It's really, um, it's really easy. It's a very like low hanging fruit thing that you can add. And having you know uh, effects like if you have like the whole instrumental uh, except for the vocal on a group and have some automations and movements in there, or if you have the whole drums and have automation of movements in there, or even just have a bunch of effects on the master that will punch in, like maybe a radio effect on the master that goes on for a second and then comes off, um, that will really, really help. Okay, so another thing I want to draw your attention to is in the mix, the texture of the drums is excellent. It's really, really excellent, but your hi-hats are so loud and so uh, up front because like there are lots of different things that will pop something to the front of the mix, okay? So I want to draw your attention to a concept that I call the three extremes, 
okay? So the three extremes are basically how you frame your mix, okay? The three extremes are the kind of like the edges of your picture, right? Because you can only, like, it's not your hand on the volume, okay? The, the sound engineer controls the volume at a live venue, and the listener controls the volume at uh, a home listening situation, right? So things can only be loud or quiet relative to each other. And the edges of your mix, the frame of the mix, represents the kind of maximalization of that space. So the three extremes are the very, very extreme highs, like, uh, you know, 6K and above defines the upper limit of the mix. The very, very low subs, like below 100 hertz, define the, the lower edge of the mix. And then the stereo image, the, the, you know, the sound that is at the sides of the mix defines, uh, you know, like if you subtract the mono signal and isolate just the sides, that will l give you the, the outer edges of the mix. So in the three extremes, I show you how you can make this uh, kind of like listening rack that you can listen to the track just all the way through, listen to the highs, listen to the track all the way through just the subs, listen to the track all the way through just the edges. And if you listen carefully to these three extremes, um, you can note the, the hierarchy of presence in the three extremes. And you'll find that like, you know, maybe at the very, very highs, the vocal is being dominated by the, the transients of the of the high sounds, as, as, as I suspect the case in your track. I think if we loaded this up and we listened to it at the three extremes rack, we would notice that the very, very highs of the mix, um, those those transients up top have much more of the upfront character there. And they're, they're kind of like bossing your vocal around, right? So I want you to listen to the three extremes and, you know, Know, it's there's not really like a hard and fast rule like all three extremes have to be loud or what have you but they just need to be intentional you know because when you listen to uh, a track for example like let's say you're in your friend's car and your track the track is really really quiet you'll you'll really only be hearing that upper extreme you're not going to hear the subs you're not going to hear really the edges of the mix you're kind of like only hearing the really really top edges and that's why like a lot of time when you turn a track down like all you really hear is the hi hats, right? So, I want you to make to you know to turn your hi hats down a lot, and to really make sure that the vocal is always the boss in the hierarchy of presence, even in the three extremes, and it'll help your mix to translate a lot. And I just think, as a general rule, hi hats can pretty much always stand to be quieter. You know, most people will put their hi hats way too loud all the time, and it really it's really kind of like a classic rookie mistake. Okay, so in addition to the three extremes, there are other aspects of the hierarchy that are worth paying attention to. And in some ways, uh, the frequency range that I like to call the pain zone can be thought of as a fourth extreme. So the pain zone is the area of the frequency spectrum that the human ear is the most sensitive to perceiving. And that is that area between about two kilohertz and four kilohertz where all of the articulation in human speech lives. And if you were to um, notch out the area between two kilohertz and four kilohertz in a spoken voice, it will sound really muffled and it'll be hard to hear the consonants that the speaker is enunciating. It'll be hard to actually hear the words that the speaker is saying, right? And the reason why this frequency range is called the pain zone is because not only is it, is it important to understand articulation, but this is the area that the human brain has evolved to be the most sensitive to. It's been hypothesized that this is because the frequency that a baby crying occupies is in that two to four kilohertz range. Um, but you know, there's not really any way to, to test that, but really between uh, that two to four kilohertz range, that, that's really the main aspect of the mix to pay attention to when you're trying to enforce this hierarchy of presence, when you're trying to get the vocal to sit in front and the rest of the sounds in the band to kind of occupy that, that band slot. And I suspect that your hi-hats are dominating the mix both in the extreme highs and in that pain zone. And uh, what I like to do is multi-band side chaining. Uh, and that is in weekly download episode 
89. And what I'll do is I'll create a side chain that's almost like a de-esser where the pain zone in the hi-hats or the pain zone in like your mid bass, like let's say, let's say you have like a, a dubstep type song where there is like a, a loud, aggressive uh, mid bass, like a top bass on the mids, and then also a vocal on top. Like um, I will show you an example. Uh, my track in the streets, um, which I wrote many, many years ago. Uh, this is one of the first, uh, one of the first big dubstep tracks that I had that did well. I wrote this in like 2006, but it was on my album. Um, it was on my album, The Ill Methodology. And in this track, I have a really, really aggressive mid bass, but then I also have vocals right on top of that aggressive mid bass. And it was this multi band side chaining technique that enabled that to be possible from uh, Weekly Download 89. And this track, like this mix down, still stands the test of time. I wrote this track in like 2006, I think 2007, and you can still play it out and it still sounds great uh, because of this multi band side chaining technique and because of this three extremes concept. So, so. Uh, no. Your me up. Left all your friend them Fuck you, fuck you Straight to the top ten, girl Me a tell you, say me want a girl They say me need a girl They gonna cut me in pain Your team say me a go ramp with you, baby Your team say me a go ramp with you Boss it Right. So, uh, you know, explore this multi-band side chaining uh, for for getting your tracks to really bang like that and explore it for, you know, getting getting your vocals to always sit on top and in front because your mix is much more minimal than the mix in that in the street song. It's really just the hi hats that are messing up that problem of presence. And if you you know, check out the three extremes and you use this multiband side chaining technique, you'll be able to get your instrumental a little louder and still have your vocal uh, go on top. Uh, but you should also check out, there is a four part series on vocals where I go into a little bit about uh, vocal processing. Uh, also be sure to watch that amazing presentation that Richard Sixth Street gave us um, about uh, mixing vocals. That was a really great presentation. But check out this four part series on vocals here, weekly downloads 72, 73, 75, and 76, uh, okay? And then um, I think a lot of you out in the chat should, uh, or a lot of you out there should also check out this weekly download about harshness. When I was going through some of the other submissions for uh, that we're, I'm unfortunately not really going to have time to get to today, but when I was going through some of the other submissions, I noticed that a lot of the submissions had a real problem with this kind of like digital harshness that tends to come out when you put a lot of OTT on your sounds and when you do a lot of like in the box kind of digital processing. Um, so there's a weekly download about harshness, number 106, that I think can help all of you out there to to get your mixes to sounding a little more, a little more smooth and a little easier on the ears, and just stop that digital processing from kind of piling up and giving us uh, ear fatigue. You'll be able to get a really loud, really full, really clean mix if you pay attention to harshness and you pay attention to some of the problems that digital processing can cause. Um, okay, cool. So uh, I, you know, there's a ton of other things in the weekly download that you can check out. Uh, the weekly download about OTT is really, really important. I think I would be remiss if I didn't point out that OTT is basically like uh, the salt of music production. OTT, it's like when you're cooking, you add salt. When you're producing, you add OTT. It just pumps everything up, makes all the flavors come to life. Uh, it really, really helps. So definitely uh, check out the weekly download on OTT. Um, and then, you know, there's weekly downloads on all kinds of things. The checkerboarding one. Um, there's a couple weekly downloads on checkerboarding that will help you with your composition and really getting your compositions to, to work. Uh, and then lately, I've been doing this series on sound design where you know there's a whole weekly download on kicks, there's a whole weekly download on snares, there's a whole weekly download on cymbals, a whole weekly download on percussion sounds, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been going through all of these different, uh, I've been going through all of these different sounds, like one at a time, all the different types of synthesis. Uh, big shouts out to our guests, like Lil Bo Weep, Andrew Huang, Mersive, uh, you, you know, uh, 
uh, Con Rank was a guest. Uh, KJ Saka is coming up. Kermode, um, you know, all all of our, our weekly download guests are fantastic. So be sure to check those all out. Uh, Seth Drake, big shouts out to Seth Drake for being a guest too. Uh, but yeah, you can see there's there's just tons and tons and tons of these weekly downloads. So get in there, uh, get into the weekly download. Be sure to ask your senseis uh, which weekly downloads are best for you. Uh, big shouts out to our track submitters. It is time now for us to go to the Producer JoJo showcase and showcase some of the amazing talent of our senseis. Uh, first, we have a set from Rip Kenny, followed by Hexus, followed by Rising Star Unk, who's been blowing it up. Bass Nectar's been playing his tracks out, and then I'm doing a set. The first First three are going to be VJ'd by our in-house VJ, VJ Radiance, and then I'm doing my own VJing and DJing live simultaneously using Serato and Mix Emergency. So big shouts out to all of you for joining us. If you want free access to the replays, be sure to go to producerdojo.com slash white belt. And if you're ready to join the dojo and get training, one-on-one -on -one personal training from our amazing senseis, as well as getting access to my live classes, as well as the entire weekly down Download archive and all that stuff. It's producerdojo.com slash yes. So say yes to your potential. Say yes. I believe in myself. I'm ready to become a black belt. I'm ready for Dylan to pay me to be a professional musician because that's really what it's all about. Team up, take over. We're all in this together. Together we uplift each other. Thank you so much for watching. Now it's time for the party. Are you ready? Give it up for Rip Kenny. like